so um, I'm going to present the work uh, by uh, uh, Shui Ying Wu, who uh, couldn't be here today. Uh, she's done a lot of work in uh, effects of microbubble shell uh, properties, as uh, we published this year, uh, as it pertains to drug delivery to the brain. Uh, just uh, a small background on uh, the drug delivery to the brain. Uh, we've been working on this uh, for a while now uh, and trying to basically cross the blood-brain barrier, which sits between uh, all capillaries in the brain, uh, between the lumen where the blood flows and um, the uh, surrounding parenchyma, uh, such as the neurons, astrocytes, uh, and glial cells. Um, and it contains a lot of uh, different cells, including the pericytes, the endothelial cells, or the tight junctions, and uh, it very effectively blocks uh, everything harmful to the brain, including uh, toxins and viruses, but it also blocks uh, things that can be therapeutic, uh, such as uh, uh, all, basic, uh, all basic drugs that are available to treat diseases that are above 400 Daltons. So uh, us and others have actually figured out how to open this barrier transiently, selectively, and non-invasively uh, with microbubbles. So uh, the main goal for, for this, uh, uh, for the drug delivery, is to uh, deliver at high efficiency the drug uh, in, 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 uh, in question, and then get large molecule drugs. So most drugs are affected in the brain, especially for neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, are very large, proteins are on the order of uh, uh, tens of kilodaltons, and uh, uh, adeno-associated viruses, I can show you down here, are on the order of uh, four megadaltons. So you can see from, we have to go from the threshold of about 400 Daltons, which is actually even the contrast agent of, in the MRI gadolinium is above that threshold all the way to 4 megadaltons. So we have to uh, go through different, different scales, um, several orders of magnitude, and try to uh, do things safely. Uh, the key is the microbubbles. Obviously, the ultrasound plays an important role as well, but we believe that with the microbubbles, as we published uh, before, we can actually get control. Uh, obviously, this doesn't need uh, an introduction in this, uh, in this session, but obviously bubbles are available commercially for imaging and diagnosis currently. Uh, so uh, we can also, uh, we have reported on uh, microbubble properties and the shell uh, that I'm going to focus on uh, can, give, can uh, vary between soft-shelled um, lipid or protein that has been uh, reported to hard-shelled, including microcapsule and polymers. Um, and similar to loading that uh, Tom uh, mentioned in his previous talk. We have looked at size in this before, um, and we reported that uh, larger bubbles after sorting, uh, especially above four to five microns, tend to be much more effective in opening the barrier at large volumes for the same pressures compared to smaller bubbles, one to two microns, which is actually more what the diagnostic bubbles are centered um, as a median diameter. Um, and lipid cell microbubbles uh, do persist uh, to dissolution and collapse uh, and uh, truth to dissolution behavior according to the acyl chain length. So the acyl chain length is actually from these lipids that actually make up the bubble, and this is actually a lipid-coated bubble with a gas core that was free of butane. And what we're going to do here is actually vary this acyl chain and see what this is the, effective, uh, the effect on the blood and barrier opening. So overall, we want to optimize the drug delivery, obviously, and see whether make changing this acyl chain will have any uh, effect whatsoever in, uh, in getting molecules of different sizes through. And we want to keep the, everything else constant, uh, including the size. So we use our lipid uh, shell monodispersed bubbles, uh, but we do change uh, to three acyl chain lengths. So the hypothesis is that uh, we, the delivery efficiency will be affected by the acyl chain length, uh, given what has been reported in the literature in the past, and we want to investigate uh, the different physicochemical effects on the efficiency for, of the, via the blood and berry opening. So these are the three different uh, shells that we have, uh, DDPC, DSPC, and the uh, LEAPC. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, they were excluding the size effect to 4 to 5 microns, and you can see the distributions of multi-sizer here centered around um, 4 to 5 microns for all the different shells, uh, both for the number fraction and the volume fraction. Experimental setup, uh, we are using mice. Uh, we're doing things in vivo, anesthetized mice. So this is an illustration of our setup. Uh, the transducer is up here. Uh, the water medium, uh, we, we have the intact scalp and skull uh, of the mouse, which has saved the fur of the mouse. Um, and then we perform a 30-second uh, sonication for uh, uh, passive cavitation detection that we uh, are recording at the same time. We administer the 
micro bubbles and the dextrins. So we actually use dextrins to vary the size of the molecule intravenously. Then we'll begin fumigating for the bladder and very opening for a minute. Uh, and then after an hour, we sacrifice. And these are our different pressures, uh, ranges, um, and the different dextrin sizes. We work with particular daltons that is uh, the size of some inhibitors used in Alzheimer's disease to break up the beta amyloid. And the neurotrophic factors that we reported on uh, yesterday, which actually are, are proteins that are helping the, the neurons to generate and on the order of uh, tens of kilodaltons. For the blood and berry opening confirmation, we use fluorescence imaging because these, are de these dextrins are fluorescent and we can actually see um, uh, what uh, actually, where we are got the opening. And then finally, uh, a safety evaluation with the form they can make. Okay, so I wanna show you first, uh, the first case which was with a smaller dextrin of three kilodaltons, and we used only 100 cycles uh, for the uh, sequence for the opening the barrier, which is a, a, a very uh, short, uh, much shorter pulse than we use uh, in other areas. Um, and this is uh, what I'm showing you here is four different panels. We go with 225 kilopascals, 300, 450 to 600, and then uh, the different shell uh, acyl chain lengths, so C16, C18, and C24. So you can see in the beginning, we don't have much opening. Where you see fluorescence, basically where the dextrin was able to diffuse throughout the hippocampus, which is uh, the memory center of the brain. And then you can see as you increase the pressure and increase, uh, and, and uh, if you increase the pressure, you actually have higher fluorescence, but there's not much happening with the shell as in chain length. So not much effect also when we do the fluorescence enhancement, no change because of the shell. So for smaller molecules, you can conclude, conclude that we have a homogeneous delivery of the dextrin as we can see in the fluorescence, but no significant shell uh, changes. When we increase to 40 kilodalton dextrins, the, the story is uh, somewhat different. Uh, we do have an increase with pressure, which we knew before, with the fluorescence increasing uh, an enhancement, but we do have a change in the shell. And in fact, uh, for, uh, we have significant shell effect of pressures, uh, which uh, cause bubble collapse. I'm gonna show you the cavitation later. Uh, but above 450, uh, in the smaller pressures, uh, there's not much effect, but above 450 kilopascals, at 450 to 600, we have a change uh, uh, between the C16 and C24 and between the C16 and C18. Um, and uh, in the 600 kilopascals, we have change among all shell, uh, all shell chain lengths. So it does make a difference uh, with uh, larger dextrin, so larger in protein, protein sizes, uh, the shell plays an important role. Uh, if we keep the dextrin the same, and now we change the number of cycles, the effect is somewhat uh, uh, more, uh, more uh, uh, reduced. Um, we have uh, also the, uh, the, uh, the change with, with the shell chain length uh, appearing only in the case of the C24 uh, compared to the C16 and C18 at the larger pressures. Um, so we conclude for larger molecules with longer pulses that we have a more diffuse delivery in the fluorescence. No difference between the smaller chain length, but a large difference uh, when we go to C24. So for the cavitation detection, uh, we looked at uh, the two different phenomena that we've seen open the barrier. The safest one is a stable cavitation with volumetric oscillation of the bubble. And the next uh, one with the increase of the pressure, you get to the inertial uh, broadband uh, cavitation where we have drastic oscillation to a potential uh, bubble collapse. So we've seen that for 100 cycles, you get a change uh, at higher pressures uh, between uh, the smaller uh, shell chain length and the higher chain length. Um, and 1,000 cycles, uh, you only have a change at 600 kilopascals between uh, the C18 and C24 chain length uh, for the stable cavitation. For the inertial cavitation, uh, we have uh, more of a change uh, at 600 kilopascals when we see more of the inertial cavitation happening. Uh, for both uh, 100 and 1,000 uh, cycles. And finally, for the delivery efficiency, which I just reported there, it actually nicely follows what we see with cavitation, especially with stable cavitation, uh, where we have, as I mentioned before, at higher pressures, a, chain, uh, a shell effect to be much more pronounced. Uh, so for safety evaluation uh, for h &E, uh, we have seen no damage at C16, so this was the safest shell by, uh, by by, by, by all accounts. Uh, at C18, uh, we had a couple of uh, RBT observations uh, in a couple of cases uh, of the mice for both 100 cycles and 1,000 cycles. And the same thing with C24, uh, with ac which actually also um, had uh, the same, uh, at the highest pressure of 600 kilopascals, 
uh, damage here. At the lower pressures, we actually have not uh, finished with the histology yet, but we figured we'd start with the 600 kilopascals because this is where we expect the most of damage. Now, this is after one hour, and you should bear in mind that this is very minimal damage. It also shows like very, very big here, and we have seen that this can be actually reversible after uh, uh, seven days. So this is uh, the, the, the most drastic damage that you're going to get. And finally, for, uh, for the assessed the delivery efficiency, uh, this is a stable cavitation dose for harmonics and antiharmonics. And we have three different, uh, four different cases, no opening, opening, no damage, and damaging. You see most of them, uh, 100 cycles and 1,000 cycles are around the opening cases. Uh, we have two cases that have no opening and a couple of cases also with, uh, with uh, uh, damage and one with no damage. Um, and then finally, the fluorescence enhancement was plotted against the stable cavitation, and we saw three, two distinct slopes uh, uh, with uh, the 100 cycles uh, being different from 1,000 cycles. So it looks like the fluorescence enhancement uh, needs uh, low, lower stable cavitation to 100 cycles compared to 1,000 cycles. So uh, different rates of, uh, of change with the fluorescence enhancement delivery. So I want to leave you with this table. Uh, so cavitation does increase uh, with uh, the cell uh, chain length. Um, we have for delivery efficiency for small molecules, it doesn't make a difference. For larger molecules, we saw that the actual uh, um, thicker shell makes a bigger difference, have, has higher uh, delivery efficiency. And unfortunately, the safety follows a little bit of that. This is very preliminary, but um, the opposite of what's happening is the delivery efficiency. Uh, you have much uh, a higher safety in C16 relative to C24. Uh, so we're currently looking at lower pressures and reversibility of the effect. I want to thank uh, my lab, the funding, uh, and of course you for your attention. Thank you.